Hello everyone and welcome to our Gem Pursuit. My name is Matthew Weldon and I'm joined in our magical and mysterious pursuit to the world of antique and vintage jewellery by my trusty co-host, Elise Ketcher. Hello, Elise. Hi, everybody. Thank you all for your lovely feedback on last week's episode where we began our new season, Royal Regalia, A History of Splendour, looking at the royal jewels and the complex family tree of the Danish royal family. This week, we are talking about a particular collection of crown jewels that has been accumulating over many centuries and stands as one of the world's most expensive and extensive collections. Elise, would you like to reveal which country we're talking about? We're talking about the amazing Iranian family royal jewels. Incredible. Super excited about this one, Elise. Let's get started. So as we're talking about crown jewels, it's always super important that we get the context of how these crown jewels got to where they actually are today. Um, Because as we mentioned in the intro there, the Iranian crown jewels date back centuries and it is super extensive and one of those impressive collections we are going to see. So Elise, what sort of history have these crown jewels got? So we'll start off with the history of the Iranian royal family, which kind of dates back to around 700 BC, which is incredible if you think about the royal families that we know of today. I don't believe any of the royal families can date all the way back to 700 BC. And this is the Midian dynasty. Now, it's important to also point out that it's not a continuous uh, family that carry this particular legacy on. Um, It goes from 700 BC and then we go through different dynasties or empires is what they're called through the different centuries until we reach the pinnacle in 1979 when um, revolution takes place in Iran. So it's, I mean, from 700 BC to 1979, you can imagine the amount of wealth that we're looking at um, from all of the all of the areas surrounding as well, we're talking really about a Persian mm. um, empire. Yeah, and a very you know one of the busiest areas in terms of trade from east to west, as well as massive natural resources in this place. You know, so the accumulation of the crown jewels. I'm sorry, and the people who really appreciated jewels in a massive way so it was a huge feature of it yes and it goes back quite a long way and as you said there were were different dynasties or empires and some had a very long time in power and some had an incredibly short time in power which I thought was quite interesting because although you know so we had uh, you know the Safavid dynasty from 1501 to 1736 that was the first time that these crown jewels were actually recorded. You know, we have records of this uh, by a French traveller uh, called Jean-Baptiste Tavernier, which thankfully... Who saw a lot of jewels. He's, he's, it's, not just, it's not just these that kind of pop up in his, um, in what he's seen. He also saw the blue diamond, mm-hmm. the hope diamond, and an array of other gemstones. So he would have really, he's really had his eyeball on some incredible things. He saw a lot of these Iranian jewels early on, and he recorded them in his, in his book, Les Six Voyages de Jean-Baptiste Tavernier. So we have a good history of them there. Yes. So from there, it continues on through many different um, families and kind of it ends in the Qajar Empire, which was 1794 to 1925 with the last Shah Ahmed Shah Qajar. That's a mouthful. And I'm very sorry if that's incorrect, if I've said that incorrectly in Persian. But he became Shah at the age of 12. And then the parliament removed his, when the parliament removed his father. That was young. (laughs) I know. But this is the thing. If you really do look through the history of um, the Persian empire, 
we're looking at a lot of war. We're looking at a lot of overturns and like twists, political twists and parliamentary yeah. coups and armies coming in and military officers taking over. It's really quite unstable. The only thing consistent about it is the instability, actually. But yeah. all throughout, though, despite, you know, at, at one stage during the Afshari dynasty, the jewels were actually, well, they were just before the Afshari dynasty, the Afghan invaded and actually took all of the jewels, uh, but the Afshari dynasty got them back. So as you said, they were going, they were coming. But despite that instability, I find it amazing that they actually held on in the end to quite a lot of them. And gained more for sure. Um, but the the coup of 1921 took some of the Shah's power away. And then during his European tour in 1923, the Shah was forced into exile and he died shortly after in his 30s. So that's kind of the end of the Qajar, Qajar dynasty or empire. And then the Pahlavi or Pahlavi, Empire then takes over with Reza Shah Pahlavi, who came from basically nothing as a mili- a Iranian military officer. And then he forcibly took Iran in 1925. And then, you know, this is where our story kind of begins, because this is where this is more along the lines of what we can see and know for today of the, the royal family that end, ended up in exile as well. So we're going to have a look then at the collection of the Iranian royal jewels. And really, it's such an extensive collection. We're going to talk about our favorite piece just after this. But to give you an overview of kind of what's included in this, I mean, it's pretty vast. And it has some of those important gemstones in uh, history, as well as also having a lot of men's jewels, which at that time, you know, we think of antique jewellery a lot of time as ladies' jewellery, but there was quite a lot of impressive men's jewellery in this collection as well. So I just want to say quickly before we go into the jewellery, a lot of the jewels, like we're, if you would like to listen to the difference between what the royal crown jewels are, the state jewels are, and what the personal jewels are of the family, then you'll have a better understanding if you listen to our first episode, which is the Danish uh, royal family episode, where we explain kind of what's the difference between the two. But when we're looking at what the actual, now they're called the Iranian national jewels because the royal family was abolished in, in 1979 where they were forced into exile um, and abdicated. And we've got all of the jewels which were left behind. So they have now become national treasures of Iran. So instead of being the royal collection, they kind of considered the national collection of jewellery. So they be- they belong to Iran essentially. And there's a few things that would really kind of maybe spring to your mind straight away when you're thinking of the crown jewels. One of them is the Pahlavi crown and the Empress's crown, which, which was seen during the coronation that took place. That coronation was amazing. And the crown, there's a really cool story behind that crown, how it even got there. There, there is. And also, we've also talked about her crown in a previous episode as well. So I, I believe it was either in the Van Cleef and Arpels episode or it was in the Emerald episode. It's one of those when we talk in extensively about the crown that Farah, um, Queen Farah wore during the coronation. Yeah, and definitely well worth listening to that. But I mean, just to give an idea of, of you know, a quick oversight of, of that crown, it was made with a lot of the jewels that was in the collection. I mean, and just to give you context, uh, you know, of when we talk about our favorite piece, there was a lot of jewels in this collection, right? And they like to keep track of them, but it was made by Van Cleef and Arpels. And obviously the full summary is in the episode, but just quickly so you have an idea. The jewels couldn't leave Iran, a bit like the Danish jewels last week. Some of them couldn't leave Iran. So what did they do? They imported a whole team from Van Cleef and Arapels for six months into Iran to actually make this crown. Now, 
I don't know how much, you know, six hours of a Van Cleef jeweler would cost, but to import <laughs> the whole team for six months would be quite something. I mean, it, it speaks of Pierre Van Cleef going over himself and handpicking the jewels out of the collection. So um, <laughs> having, you know, it would be like having Louis Cartier. Louis Cartier, will you come and like pick out jewels from my collection to what would go into you know, a, a piece for me to wear to a coronation. It's literally stuff out of fairy tales. It's not, this is not your normal pieces of jewellery. This is historical, otherworldly jewels, which we don't even see, you know, on, on, a, on a scale of what we see on our day-to-day. Something like this would be so out of out of our minds because we're looking at emeralds that you know are the are the size of little mandarins like where it's <laughs> it, you know you would look at it and be like what is going on this is beyond you know beyond incredible a collection like this oh, yeah. but it's important to understand that when you're a royal family and you're um you're gaining all of this wealth over centuries you're also inheriting other pieces through marriages the last shah of iran had three wives and all of them were exquisitely beautiful. His first wife was a, a princess of Egypt and looked like Hedy Lamar. She had these beautiful ice blue eyes and dark black hair and, you know, came from a, her own royal family, grew up in palaces, the palaces of Egypt. And she bought her own pieces with her to the Iranian royal family. Now, that ended in divorce and some of her jewels went with her and some of the jewels went with her daughter. And this is the this is where we find out more about what is coming into these royal families. Marriages also added to the collection through the centuries. And we we don't even know because the their particular collection itself goes on and on and on. I mean, we have over 30 tiaras in this collection. We have crowns in this collection. So tiaras being something that's worn um, by women and uh, studded with uh, different gemstones. Crowns are used for regalia. So something that you wear when you're crowned. For instance, the last Shah crowned himself in 1967. So we also have loose gemstones. So there's known to be a chest filled with Persian pearls. And when I say a chest, like we think, oh, you know, tiny little chest. No, we're talking about a chest full of natural pearls. This is also a part of um, the collection. Also, the chest itself would be considered a jewel today because it would also be created with an array of gemstones that would again be part of the collection. And I think for anyone listening, just to get an idea of, you know, Elise is talking about natural pearls there. I I was only having a discussion yesterday with one of our neighbours here who has a shop uh, and they were saying that they bought a pearl ring, uh, was signed by Boucheron and it had a big pearl in it. And turned out that this pearl was a natural pearl, just one pearl. (laughs) And they were telling me how this was like the best day. They bought this ring. They bought it as a a Koya pearl. It turned out to be a natural pearl. And I mean, he was practically telling me, you know, how he was going to retire over this one, one pearl. (laughs) And as you're saying, like a chest full in its entirety of these pearls. Yeah, but this is like Aladdin's cave, right? So that's, you know, you're like, yeah, a chest of pearls. By the end of it, you literally just look at it, yeah, hand wave yeah, at it, relative. whatever, a, ch- yeah. a chest of pearls. We've also got coronation necklaces with the largest emeralds you've ever seen. Green, perfect, clarity, high and gorgeous. Yeah. Carved work on some of them. Others are on cabochon, which is like round and domed. Others are faceted. We also have jewel dish covers and jewel dishes to wash your hands in made of solid gold. We have golden flagons that are as bejeweled. We have um, 
shield. We actually have a, yes. a Nadar Shah's shield, which I think in has one of in the center of the shield it has one of the largest rubies in the world, which is about two hundred and twenty five carats. Uh, you know, and there's a lot of, you know, if you listen to our Ruby episode in our Gemstone series, we talk about rubies, how they were, You th- the people wore them into battle and thought that they'd be safe. Yeah. Well, I mean, you'd, you'd probably just stop and look at the soldier and be like, you are so beautiful. And then your head would be cut off while you're staring at the ruby. Yeah. But if you because- had a shield of a ruby, I would, sh- I think I'd just sacrifice my arm. <laughs> like... Don't hit that. like, look at the ruby. It's yeah. so beautiful. But it goes on and on and on. The imperial sword is another one as well. The oh, imperial yeah. sword is, you know, was worn <laughs> by was worn by the Shah when he was when he like, was being crowned uh, when he crowned himself. Yeah, like what didn't they put jewels in? No, they put it in everything. They even have um what's this what's the smoking device that they the shish sh- sh- shisha. shisha shisha yeah yeah. They have the most expensive shisha in the world which again is set with diamonds, emeralds, rubies and pearls. The the most expensive shisha in the world. So, it's like, you know, if you want, you know, if I want to wash my hands and I'm the Shah, I want to have jewels on it. If I want to smoke, I want to have jewels on it. If I want to go to battle, I want to have jewels on it. If I want to have a sword, I want jewels on it. It's just everything. Even their coronation cape is studded with jewels. But they, oh, well, oh. who wants to eat that? Well, uh, I don't think that would be good for you anyway, but um <laughs> Well, and we can't forget the the peacock throne that they have. I mean, they literally have a throne. I that's think we've jeweled. forgotten a lot of things. Yeah, not that we, but as as you said, you know, we didn't go into so much detail about the legalities of who owns. In terms of, we went into a lot in the Danish episode about what's crown jewels and what's personal collection. You know, we just want to talk about the jewelry. But I mean, this this throne, which is named the Tak Karshid, or the Sun Throne, it's literally a bejeweled throne. But anyway, it is an extensive collection. Anything and everything that could be bejeweled was bejeweled. And it really is one of the most extensive and expensive collections in the world. And I know picking a favourite is going to be very, very difficult. But still to come... We'll share where you can see this collection in person and also reveal our favorite piece. But first, we have some very beautiful new pieces which I've added to our Instagram this week. Elise, can you tell us about one or two of those? So upcoming in the episode, Matthew talks about his favorite piece, but I'm not going to spoil that, but it does have to do with voyaging. I thought I would kind of link into that with a very rare piece that we currently have on our Instagram, which is a silver compass from the Victorian period. It's really such a beautifully hand-painted dial that's done on rock crystal with a working compass in the center and a surround that has been scalloped inward with sterling silver. And this piece would have been worn either as a pendant or as a little keepsake on a Albert chain. And it is uh, really beautiful. The link to it will be in our show notes. Yes. And of course, you'll find them on our Instagram at Courtville Antiques and the link in the show notes as at least mentioned. Well, let's get back to the podcast. I'm going to bring in the favourites by letting Matthew go first because I've got a really long story. So I'm going to, I'm going to leave, I'm going to leave it first with you, Matthew, and um, tell us what your favorite piece of this collection is, because you really would have been digging through the archives to try and choose one of these because they're just so many. There's so many and there's so many unusual ones. And when I was picking the favorite, my favorite one, I guess I just went with something that I thought was just so unusual. And the reason they made it, it's so simple, but it's just, it's so simple, but it captures a lot of how jewellery or why jewellery is made. And it's also just something that like only an Iranian, you know, 
dynasty would do that you wouldn't even think about or I wouldn't think about this. This is, I'm going to talk about the Golden Globe, not anything to do with the event, but the original Golden Globe, which is part of the, uh, cre- well, it was created by the Iranian court jewelers in 1869. It was commissioned by Nazar al-Din Shah. So when I say this is a Golden Globe, I literally mean this is a 43 inch high, 18 inches in diameter, Golden Globe, and the net weight of the gold that was used in it was 34 kilos. Love so, it. So, I mean, you need a fairly solid table to hold this globe, right? But It's too big to go on a table. I've seen it. It stands on the ground. Yes. it's. Oh, yeah. Yeah. It's like a freestanding globe. But the reason why they made this globe is that the Shah, he thought it was a decorative way of safeguarding his loose gemstones. He was so afraid of losing these or misplacing them that he thought, well, they need to be put into one place, which I totally understand if they're, you know, if they're somewhere in there and somewhere in there, you kind of forget what you have. But he thought if they're all in one place, at least well, I'll know what I have. Uh, So he decided to build a giant golden globe, as you do. It has 51,366 stones. The oceans and the seas and the lakes are composed of emeralds, which I thought was interesting because my intuitive thought would have been that they'd be sapphires. Sapphires, but they're- but it's what you can get your hands on, I guess. And they don't really have sapphires in their collection. Um, the land masses are made up of rubies and spinels for the most part, but Iran, Britain, France, part of Southeast Asia, are made up of diamonds and. South Africa and part of the Sahara and part of Egypt are made of a blue sapphire. So there are some blue sapphires. Uh, the equator, ecliptic, and the outlines of the continents are marked in diamonds. So that's like your outline is marked in diamonds, just to, in case you wouldn't see the, the difference between the emeralds and the rubies. And actually, what, when you look at it, that they're the part that strike me. It's the lines of a latitude are also in rubies. Then you've also got like any major geographical feature is written in Persian script uh, and diamond studded, raised off it. It's, it's, as you said, it's freestanding. It's on a frame and a pedal. So that's made of wood, but it's overlaid in gold. And, you know, it must be thick gold because 34 kilos. And you'll remember that we talked in, when we talked to Juliette Weir de la Rochefoucauld in our episode about women designers in jewellery, she mentioned that jewellery designers... It's not like a menu. It's not like you go in and say, well, I'd like to you know, order this, this and this. Jewelry design is more like, you know, looking in your fridge and seeing what you have yeah. and making something of that. And this is a perfect example of someone with incredible midnight munchies and they just made this incredible <laughs> globe. So I don't know, for I mean, me, that was... I mean, inc- we're not really talking in, in terms of a fridge. We're not really talking about a fridge. We're talking about a supermarket when we're looking at the, <laughs> <laughs> at the Iranian yeah. royal jewels. I mean, it's like, mm, what should I leave behind? Because they could put anything in that globe. It could have been made out of pearls. Yeah. It could have been made out of literally anything. But the fact that the amount of richness and wealth. Um, I think this is like getting to the pinnacle points here. This is why there is no longer a royal family. You know, when you're looking at such decadence, the people surrounding the royal family were seeing these visuals of the royal family living like this. And it just wasn't Mm. something that the people were going to allow to happen anymore. And, you know, you can understand when you're talking about this globe, like originally there was no photographs and there was no insight into how the royal how the royals lived. But as we got into the 60s and 70s and there was Mm. a real vision of what was going on inside of those palaces and the wealth that they had, which was the pinnacle of the downfall of their empire was really the party that they held in 1971, which was no, is still known today as the most expensive party in the world. And it was to celebrate 
the 2500th year of or anniversary of the Persian Empire. And I mean, when we talk about a party, this particular party, it... <laughs> It like blows everything that you can think out well, of the I mean, water. Our staff party last year was pretty good. <laughs> I mean. Okay. Well, let me tell you just a, quickly before we move on to mine, who was invited to this party? But I think, and it's super important, this party is because when we talk about where the, the jewels are today, the end of the Pahlavi dynasty, which was, as you say, this party. This was the beginning of the end. Yeah, no, this this it's party really was the nails in the coffin, right? So who was invited to this party? We had nine kings, five queens, 16 presidents, two sultans, and it continues on to uh, so many dignitaries throughout the world that were invited to this particular party. It was held out in the middle of the desert, close to Cyrus, the who's known who's known as the kind of Shah who began the Persian dynasty. It was held near his um, tomb out in the middle of the desert. The desert was seen as inhabitable because there was so many species of snakes and scorpions and deadly bugs. Uh, the Shah was like, no, I still want it to happen. So go out there and get rid of all of that. So they killed and removed three truckloads of wildlife from the area, bugs, scorpions, snakes, to make it inhabitable for the party that was going to take place, which was only going to be for a short time. And then they were moving out of there. So you can imagine like three truckloads, that in itself, the amount of the amount of work to just do that would have been crazy. He also said he wanted to have the best chefs. So he went to Maxim's in Paris, which at the time was the most... Oh celebrated restaurant in the world with the most celebrated chefs. Is that the one that the Louis Cartier used to go to? Correct. Ah. He flew over the whole staff and paid for all of the expenses that they would have lost when they were in Paris for having to close down. So he, yeah. he flew over yeah. the whole, sh the whole restaurant basically. And all of the food from Paris was flown in daily so that they could cook at this party. They also had air conditioned tents. They had in the middle of the desert, they had all of these palm trees put in and, you know, they were watered so that they, they could look lush and green. I mean, the amount of work and the amount of money that went into this was really what started the Iranian re revolution. I'm just reading some of the things they did here. Oh my. Like, so, as you said, they removed the local wildlife. 50,000 songbirds were imported from Europe, many of which, you know, died almost instantly because, because of the it's, heat. It's the heat. Then the food they had, they imported 380,000 eggs, 30 kilos of caviar, 2,700 kilos of pork, beef and lamb. And uh, it's not only that, they also had to provide the security for all of those dignitaries that were going to be oh, there. Yeah. It was the first time that a United States president and the second in charge were in the same place on on foreign soil because they, I'm guessing both of them didn't want to miss it. So it's, it's a crazy party. This is really important to kind of underline as part of the history. This, what this party really was the end of the dynasty. It was, it was kind of like eight years later that they were, you know, that they were forced into yeah, exile. Yeah, But, but it, this really was the nail in the coffin. It was like, we're, this is too much now. Like this is for everybody else, but what are the people getting? Yeah. So and that's important to when we, especially, you know, when we talk about where the pieces are now, but what is your favorite piece? You know, I'm delighted <laughs> to hear. I mean, you want, I know that's your favorite party, uh, but what? No, I just wish I hadn't been at the party. Talking about parties, the other party that I want to talk about or what I'm going to delve into now is Muhammad Riza Pahlavi and his love of women. So this man had, I've touched on it earlier, had three wives. Not only were they like supermodel beautiful 
all three of them. The first wife, Fazia, was a princess of Egypt, known for her ice blue eyes and um, mm. black hair was not happy in Iran at all when she moved there. She was like, she was like, this place is so behind in according to like where she'd come from. The palaces were subpar. The food was subpar. Um, and she just didn't feel at home there. She also had her first or the first daughter, which was princess Shahnaz. And it was prophesied that if the first born of the current Shah was a girl that the empire would fall. Mm -hmm. So she was highly unfavored because she produced a a girl instead of a boy. And by her in-laws, they were extremely terrible to her. There's accounts of them smashing vases over her head and things like that. So she moves back to Egypt and they divorce. His second wife, Soraya, uh, again, (laughs) beautiful. She ends up being an actress, but she finally finds out that she's infertile and has no children to the Shah. But apparently she's the only woman that the Shah has ever truly loved. But because she refused to be a second wife, um, they also divorced and she never remarried and moved to Paris and became an actress. And then the third wife, Farah, was a architect student in France, uh, in Paris, when the Shah came to visit and he met her at the embassy. She was 21 years old at the time and uh, he took a fancy into her. Um, and you know, all of these women were not only stunningly beautiful, they were extremely clever. And this particular, uh, this particular woman, Farah was again, striking to look at, but also extremely intelligent, um, and turned out to be exactly what the dynasty needed or the empire needed at the time because she was young, she was willing to come back to Iran and they married in 1959. Now, what I want to talk about is her wedding tiara. So I know last week I spoke about married Queen, now Queen Mary's tiara that she wore for her wedding, which was a gift. This tiara kind of like would eat her tiara for, you know, a snack because it is so huge. It's so huge. In fact, that it's two kilograms. Um. (laughs) Imagine going around with a two kilogram weight on your head. That actually would be like the time limit that you could wear. That would be I, I really don't think you would mind, okay? Now, the most important part of this tiara is not the fact that it was made by Harry Winston, who we also have an episode on if you want to go back and listen to the life of Harry Winston. But it was commissioned as a kind of gift for the wedding by Muhammad Reza Pahlavi um, in 1958. And it was created with white, pink and yellow diamonds and also fancy blue diamonds. Um, And then centered in the center of this particular piece is the the Noor Al Ain, So the Noor Al Ain is a 60 carat pale pink fancy diamond that was originally part of a bigger diamond called the Great Table Diamond that was discovered discovered in the Golconda India mines in the 17th century. Now, how it ended up into the crown jewels of the Iranian royal family has to do with what Matthew was saying earlier about the Mughal empire taking jewels and then there being a war and then them going in and taking jewels back. This is part of the jewels that were plundered and taken during that particular time. And it was split into two 
it was the great table diamond was split into two. It was split into this 60 carat diamond, which is called the Nor Al Ul Ain, which means light of the eye in Persian and in Arabic. And the second one was even larger and it was called, or it is called the Daya Il Nor, which again is thought to be the largest pink diamond in the world. Now, this particular tiara was worn fabulously by uh, Queen Farah uh, on her wedding day in the at the end of the 1950s. But because of the absolute value of these two stones, not only historically, but the fact that they're fancy pink diamonds, the yes. largest in the world, it's thought that there is no way to actually put a value on them. Like, Nobody knows what the value could be today. Yeah, if it was just the diamond, if it was just the diamond, the price would be incomprehensible. Yes. But add in the provenance, the history, yeah, the crazy amount. But yeah. it's for this reason as well that we don't have any current pictures, photographs, weights, dimensions, nothing of these stones. We know that they exist. We know that they're most likely in the Royal Collection because that's where they were left. But no additional, like they've never been, they don't have anybody who, an expert who's looked at them and given the clarity grades on them or obviously nobody from the Iranian state wants to release that information about these stones. So we know that they exist. We've got photographs of them. We've got pictures of them set in jewellery. But the real nitty gritties of these stones is somewhere in the ether. So I suppose where you'll see these stones today, and we like just, you know, and not, not just stones, the collection. Of course, if you want to s- physically see this collection, a lot of it is on display at the Central Bank of the Islamic Republic, uh, which is in Tehran. So <laughs> You're right. That's where they are. So it's located in the basement of the Central Bank of Iran. Basically, how they ended up there was that Iran wanted to boost their their economy, right? So the jewels were then given to the bank and kept at the bank as kind of capital to boost to lend out on it. Yeah. Exactly. To boost the to boost the economy. Now when Queen Farah was exiled and when they fled to Egypt in 1979, um, looking for asylum there, you know, she was questioned about the jewels. Like, did you take any of the jewels with you? You know, did you take the Persian turquoise tiara that's in the collection that you're known for? Did you take, you know, the Nor Al Ain? And she was like, no, like I... I have no need for tiaras outside of my home, like outside of my country. That's where they belong. They belong there. So she, she had this kind of innate knowledge in her as well, that these jewels do belong in Iran, that they're there specifically for um, the celebration mm. of the Iranian culture. And I believe that too. I'm really happy that they have a place, a safe place for these pieces to be and for the inhabitants of Iran to see the splendor and the um, the wondrous gemstones and history that they do have there. It's an incredible mm. collection. I would love to go there. I don't know if I would be, um, if it would be safe enough to go there to see the jewels, but I did look on their website and it said as of December, 2023, yeah. that the, the collection is not on currently on show. Yeah. I mean, 
yeah, if you were going to vi- seriously going to visit them, it would be a trip that re- require a lot of planning. I'd actually would love to go to see yeah, those. Yeah, I, I mean, mean it's it literally be- like Aladdin's cave, you know, like history and color and vibrancy and the best of the best. We're talking about like, you know, your dishes made of gold, solid gold rubies on your dish that are bigger than any ruby that we've ever seen it's it's beyond belief it's you know yes. you're a di- a pink diamond the size of your eyeball matthew like come That's, on that was uh that was would be impressive um but in the case that you can't visit you'd want to check any uh, guidelines from your government just in case you want to visit some photos you could look up. If you look up the wedding of the Shah of Iran and Farah Deba, there's some beautiful photos of the pieces being worn there. Uh, at the coronation in 1967, the Shah of Iran and Empress Farah, actually, which are two separate events as well. You'll see some really good pictures there. And again, at the, the party that we talked about, the celebration of the 2,500 years of Persian Empire, 25 centuries, if you look up that party, you will see lots of pictures of the pieces being worn at that party as well. All seen in the show notes. So I really hope you enjoy hearing about the fascinating history and beautiful collection of the Iranian crown jewels. We'll be back with another episode of our Royal Regalia History of Splendor season with a very iconic Royal Family's Crown Jewels collection. If you did enjoy this podcast, please do me a favor and hit that follow button now as it really helps the podcast grow. The more we grow, the better research we can do and the more guests that we can get. And if you really, really like this show, a review would also be fantastic. Just to let everyone know what the show's about and what they might get for listening to it. So on that note, Elise, I'd like to thank you again for joining me for another episode of Gem Pursuit. Thanks everyone. And as you mentioned, if you want to see any of the pieces we talked about just check the description area of this podcast and of course thanks to our podcast producer dustpod.io and a special thank you to veronique gauguin for her extensive research veronique is a listener of the show and actually got in touch with us recently and now assisting with some of the research and she is doing a fantastic job so thank you veronique until the next time for me matthew weldon chat to you soon